Look at this thing about MG off the telly. The classic MG Roadsters brought the joy of driving a lightweight, agile car to millions of people around the world. It was a car that handled well, felt like it was going fast, and gave its drivers more fun for the dollar than anything else on the road. You don't need to be wealthy to tackle the open road in an MG. More fun for the dollar than anything else on the road. Hmm. Yeah, today's MG has about as much to do with yesteryear's MG as these consoles have to do with Sony and Nintendo, or these shoes have to do with Nike, or this spread has to do with Ferrero, or this soap has to do with Dove. You get the idea. Today's MG is less about the thrill of driving and more about the thrill of getting something cheap. With a range comprising of basically hatchbacks of various shapes and sizes. But why not, right? I mean, it's dead easy for a car person like me to get all snotty and use that fact as a stick to beat new MG with. But the thing is, if the company was going to pin all its hopes on a classic British sports car, making a new one of those that is, then it would be out of business before you can say new TVR. Little car joke there. Let me type TVR into the comments if you got that one. Anyways, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all that because in my view, here in the UK today, MG is pitched pretty much in exactly the right place. Basically, the same place Skoda used to be before it started out Volkswagening Volkswagen. Like, for boomers, Okay, boomer. Or for Gen Xers, even. Yeah. It still has a slight whiff of the exotic about it, arguably. Or charm, at least. While for anybody younger, TikTokers and that. It's been reframed as a value brand with a sprinkle of added domestic appeal. And so, finally, we come to this, the MG ZS EV. And to the focal point of this piece, which is that this is probably the best value electric car on sale in the UK today. Uh-huh. Not the cheapest, and it is an important distinction that but the best value. So while you will easily find electric cars with lower list prices than this, the Fiat 500e, for example, or the Smart 44 electric, you will also find that electric cars of roughly the same size and shape as the MG here are considerably more expensive. In essence, with this car, you're getting the space of a Hyundai Kona for the price of a Vauxhall Corsa E. Honestly, right, I was genuinely shocked at how low the lease prices are on this. This is a properly good value car. So head to Vanarama to have a look at that after you've watched the review here. So, space, the first frontier of this review. You're looking at a family crossover here, which is to say you're looking at an SUV shaped car with front wheel drive. And which is also to say that this feels very spacious. Yep, plenty of rear room, both knee and bunce. And behind that, a substantial boot. 448 litres worth of it. And that is exactly the same boot capacity as you get in a regular MG ZS with ice in it, internal combustion engine. That's because the battery pack is ensconced between the wheels in the floor. Now, to give you some context for the boot spaces, look at these figures here. You'll see that the ZS trounces, that's right, trounces the similarly sized Hyundai Kona electric. And I'm just showing you a Corsa to kind of hammer home what I mean about value with this thing. Again, Corsa, different class of car, I know that, but it's also an electric car of a similar price to this. So now you're probably asking yourself, where has this cost cutting happened? This must have less stuff in it than Newcastle United's trophy cabinet. That might change now if they kick those six teams out of the league. <laughs> the answer is... Just the two specifications, one called Big Sight and the other called Exclusive. They really dropped the ball there by not calling it Very Excite. Right? Anyways, they all come with keyless entry, smartphone integration, navigation. The only thing that's really disappointing is the NAF four speaker stereo. But more importantly, it does come with a package called MG Pilot, which basically incorporates a load of safety stuff, including lane keeping, adaptive cruise control automatic crawling in traffic jams, and speed limit recognition. It is five star safe, this thing. For me, base model is all the MG ZS EV that you need, because if you go up to exclusive spec, it does add a couple of nice things like upholstery 
in the leather style, but it does not really make this feel like a fancier car. And that's mainly because it doesn't drive like one. Now it drives fine, mostly very nicely, in fact, but it can never quite shake the sense that it's a low cost car. Shake being the operative word there. Fundamentally, the chassis has a very not stiff feel, flaccid, if you like. What that does is make it soft and kind of comfy in a basic sort of a way, but it also makes it feel quite unsettled. Now, in a car like this, that's obviously better than it being all over firm and sporty and MG, but it also makes it feel kind of old school or a bit like it's already got 100,000 miles in the chassis. Another reason it's so cost effective is because it's not really on the cutting edge of electric drivetrain tech. But that's not to say it's bad, far from it. Instead, it's adequate, highly adequate. On a basic level, the battery range looks a little on the low side and that might be a deal breaker for you. But in my view, it's more than enough. You'll get a good couple of days driving out of it and you'll just have to keep on top of it like you would with any electric car plug it in overnight at your house. And it does come with a CCS system, that's the Combined Charging System system. It's at the front, under the MG badge. Now that means that if you can get to a 50 kilowatt speed charging station, you will get it from roughly empty to 80% in about 40 minutes fast. That's not a huge amount of time to have to sit in a depressing service station. More likely, you're gonna be charging it overnight from your seven kilowatt home wall box. And in that case, it'll go to 100% in about six and a half hours. For me, the range itself really isn't that much of an issue. I'd say that what makes it feel old school or a bit budgety are some of the quirks of the drivetrain. So for example, it has these three switches behind the gear selector. Very nice gear selector actually, rotary, feels good to use. And they're all shortcuts linked to the drivetrain. So on the left, you've got your driving modes. In the middle, you've got KERS, which is really cool because it evokes F1, kinetic energy recovery system. And this one on the right says battery and it shows you how much range you've got left on the little central screen here between the dials. On the one hand, that's quite cool because it allows you to quickly see how much battery you've got left, change the driving modes or change the brake energy recapture strength. One gives you an almost freewheel type situation. It doesn't quite fully freewheel. Two, somewhere in the middle. And then three gives you something close to that one pedal driving thing where if you're in regeneration level three, you lift off the throttle, and you can feel the car braking quite strongly. Personally, I don't like that. I like the car to freewheel, okay? It feels more normal. But the car always defaults to three, so every time you get in this car, if, like me, you prefer it to be on level one, you have to knock the switch back twice, and it's not a big deal. It's just annoying. It's basic that this car doesn't have, say, driving profiles that allow you to set up whether you want it in sport to default or eco to default, and which level between one and three brake energy recapture you want. The rest of the driving experience is kind of similar. Charmingly old school. I said that really geordie like old school. It's nice, but it's also flawed in parts. So I've already talked about the ride quality and it's the sort of situation that degrades with speed. So if you're just doing town speed, it's very soft, very supple, feels good. But on a B road or on motorway speed, it just never ever quite settles down. So you've always got this kind of wobble that you're dealing with. Not uncomfortable, but not luxurious either. I know this isn't a luxury car, but you don't have to be a luxury car to have sophisticated ride quality, as a lot of Citroen stuff is showing now. Dynamics are relevant, right? We don't need to talk about how this car handles as such. What's more important is what it feels like as a day-to-day -day runabout. So it gets the basics right. It sits you quite high. The visibility at the front is really good. You can really see the corners of the bonnet. Back over, not so good. Classic thing, really thick C pillars. There is a... <laughs> There is a tiny little triangle of glass cut into the C pillars, but for visibility's sake, it is absolutely useless. But it's got a tall glass house. It feels really airy. The steering is light. Even in sport mode, the steering is light. And some people might like that because in sport mode, the throttle response is a lot sharper. So you do get that sense, as with all electric cars, that this car picks up really nicely, that it's quick. You know, it sticks okay. It's possibly not as clumsy as you think it's going to be, given how it moves around on its suspension. But, <laughs> a sports car of yesteryear, <laughs> it certainly is not, There's my obvious statement of the day. But as per the ride quality degrading with speed, so too does the NVH in general. So not only is the car bouncing around a lot more on the motorway, wind noise is not ideal. It whistles a lot, this car. 
to be honest with you, the noise of this car at motorway speeds, between the whir of the engine, it does have that sort of futuristic wine thing happening, and the wind noise across the pillars and the wing mirrors almost enters into din territory, categorically speaking. It feels more like a budget car as you increase its speed. So I'll get this up to 60 here. I don't know whether you can hear that, but quite a lot of road noise quite a lot of wind swirling around the cabin. I mean, it's not terrible, it just doesn't have the sort of high speed refinement that you would get in a Kona or an Enero or a Nissan Leaf, even a Mini, Mini Electric that is. And in the cabin, same sort of deal. You'll get on with it, great, as long as everybody understands that this is not a car designed to be at the apex of the electric vehicle experience, but rather to give you a more accessible way in. It's Colin the Caterpillar, but by Aldi. The iconic birthday staple, Colin the Caterpillar, is going to war with lookalike Cuthbert. Topical. So there are a few bits that you might categorise as what might happen if Aldi did Mercedes, these air vents, for example, and the way that the passenger side dashboard feels quite familiar. But I mean, whatever, you're not going to care about that. It all looks nice. It's slightly spongy in the right places, or I would argue the wrong places, but the conventional places, that's hard. That's all hard. And it's a bit creaky. So here's the center console. Listen. And nothing's really damped. Grab handles aren't damped. Glove box isn't damped. Damped. Um, and then I mentioned this in the Passat review. All this stuff is like exposed, not great. Those are just the little signs that corners have been cut. But there are some nice touches. I'll give you a little one. I've said about the gear selector, that feels good. And then under here, under the center console, there's a couple of USB ports. And you can plug your phone in there and then there's this little hole on this pad here so you can feed your charging cable up and sit your phone on there if you want to while charging it but then the infotainment right it is another classic case of style before substance looks quite nice it's got these large colorful tiles but the screen always feels about half a second behind you and you will probably find that apple carplay or android auto are your saviors here you want to bypass all this proprietary software and just use the phone maker stuff just a little thing. The volume dial has a button in the middle that you can press, but it doesn't do anything. You assume that that's a mute button or an on-off button, and it is literally nothing. <laughs> Driving position is sort of the same. It works, but you can't adjust this steering wheel for reach. I don't know why I was pulling on it, because it will be locked. Just another little cut corner there. But I fit. All of me. Yep, all of me. As will. All of you. Yep all of you, all your family and your stuff and that, I mean. And yeah, it doesn't have the depth of the Korean stuff in pure quality or even dynamic terms, nor does it have quite the battery range that you might desire. And it's not got that much personality either. But you just can't overlook its combo of comfort, space, and value. I've actually found myself recommending this car to someone recently. It's somebody who had a first gen leave and wanted an electric car still because they were sold on that whole thing, but just needed a bit more space. And they wanted it without having to spend a ton of money. And this car was just bang on for them. And that's the thing about this car. It's kind of easy to criticize, but it's also very easy to recommend at the same time. And that is the perfect conclusion. So we'll end it there. Thank you for watching. Really do appreciate your time. Comment, subscribe, notification bell, Panorama, etc. Thanks very much and good night.